Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Viacom CBS's stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Viacom CBS is a mass media and entertainment company. It operates over 170 networks and reaches 700 million people across 180 countries. It has one of the industry's most extensive libraries of television and film. The company's main properties include Paramount's Film and Television Studio, the CBS Entertainment Group, and many channels including MTV, Nickelodeon, BET, Comedy Central, and Showtime. The company offers streaming services, which includes Paramount Plus and Pluto TV. It offers international versions of its networks as well. Viacom and CBS have a really convoluted history. Viacom was originally started by CBS in 1952. In 1971, CBS spun off Viacom into its own company. The company was forced to do this because the FCC forbid television networks from owning syndication companies. In 1993, the FCC reversed this rule. In 1999, Viacom acquired CBS. In 2006, Viacom and CBS split apart once again. CBS and Viacom merged in December 2019, which is the company we are looking at in this video. The company is headquartered in New York, New York. It was founded in 2019. It trades on the NASDAQ, Deutsche Börse, Mexican Bolsa, Vienna, and Sao Paulo Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 24 billion market cap. They're trading at $37 a share and they have 647 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they have their most free cash flow in the trailing 12 months, 2.6 billion. This is the cash that's remaining after paying all your expenses. So it's a cash that's left over for you, the investor. Net income is a profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. That also peaked in the trailing 12 months at 3.4 billion. Revenue is a sales for the company and that was 14 and a half billion. Then the companies merged and that doubled to 28 billion. It dropped a little in 2020 as companies were trying to save money cutting expenses due to COVID, but it has come up in the trailing 12 months close to 27 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Here's a breakdown of their 2018, 2019, and 2020 revenue from their 10K. They received 11 billion of revenue from their traditional TV programs, 12 and a half billion from cable networks, and 2.6 billion from films and entertainment. The reason there's a negative down here is because some revenue falls into multiple buckets. So to avoid double counting, they minus it out down here. They generated 5 billion of advertising revenue from their TV networks and almost 5 billion from the cable networks. This is from the commercials you see when you watch TV or use their streaming services. They do receive lots of advertising revenue during big events like the Super Bowl or during the presidential elections. They receive 3.1 billion of revenue from affiliate and TV and 6 billion from cable networks. These are fees from third parties carrying their TV shows or streaming services. Also their subscription fees for its streaming services. In content licensing, they generate 2.4 billion plus 1.8 billion. This includes DVD sales, revenue from video on demand, and fees paid by other companies for using their trademarks. Also, other streaming services use their content. So those streaming services like Netflix or Disney Plus have to pay this company a licensing fee. They generated 700 million in home entertainment. This category increased a lot when they acquired Miramax. This company was started by Harvey and Bob Weinstein. The name Miramax is named after their parents, Miriam and Max. And they generate a 1.6 billion of revenue when they license out their film content to third parties. So you can see the company has many sources of revenue. And the nice thing is they can sell international. Nearly 25% of their revenue is outside the US. 
About 10% of their revenue is from streaming services, 1.4 billion from advertising, and they generated 1.1 billion from their subscribers. Of the 2.6 billion of streaming revenue, 900 million was from TV, 1.7 billion from cable. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit, and that was highest in the trailing 12 months. Below that is their operating expenses, then below that is their operating income, which was also the highest in the trailing 12 months. Things seem to be moving in the right direction for this company. They have a good amount of debt on their balance sheet, so they paid over $1 billion of interest on their debt. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which was $3.4 billion, their highest ever. The reason their net income was so low in 2020, not because they had low operating income, it was because they passed through a $570 million write-off. This is a non-cash item, so it's a counting loss, it's not a cash loss. I would just focus on operating income when I look at the income statement. Sometimes the things below that can really skew the numbers. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. So they do generate a lot of cash flow, almost $3 billion in the trailing 12 months. And their capex is small relative to their operating cash flow, only about 10%. They spend about $300 million a year in capex. These are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And they do have lots of free cash flow remaining. So they do pay a nice dividend. They also buy back stock. They bought back nearly 600 million of stock in 2018. When a company buys back stock, it decreases the shares outstanding, making your shares more valuable. It looks like they added a lot of debt in 2020. They did pay down a lot of debt in the trailing 12 months. So that offsets the debt they added in 2020. This is the equity section of their balance sheet. They have $20 billion of equity. They raised $33 billion from selling their business, and they profited $12 billion from running their business. They seem to be a generous company because not only do they pay a nice dividend, they bought back a lot of stock. They bought back $23 billion of stock. Treasury stock is when you buy stock off the open market and put it into your balance sheet. And this brings down your equity balance. If a company buys back a lot of stock, it could result in a negative equity balance. Boeing is in this situation. But that's not a terrible thing because they could just reissue that stock into the market if they need cash. Let's look at the capital structure. They have 20 billion of equity, 19 billion of debt. They have 51% equity, 49% debt. Their net debt is 14 billion, so they could pay a chunk of their debt with the cash on their balance sheet if they wanted to. And their WAC is 8%. I gave them the lowest WAC on Finbox. Since Simply Wall Street has a whack of 7.29%, to be conservative, I gave them 8%. The higher the whack, the lower your valuation is, which means it's more conservative. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's $43 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $38 billion. We divide that by 647 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $59. They're trading at $37, so they're trading at a 37% discount. It's a buy according to the model. The average analyst projects their revenue to grow 3.2%. I grew their revenue 3.2% for the next two years, but I doubled that to 6.4% because I think they could have greater revenue growth with the acquisition of CBS. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. To get their future free cash flows, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. So I summed up these four free cash flow numbers. I divided by these four revenue numbers. And that comes out to 7.1%. So I multiplied the revenue estimates by 7.1%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. Simply Wall Street's at $69 a share. They're saying it's 46% undervalued. Eight analysts priced this stock and the average price target was 63. The low was 44, the high was 90. In March 2020, the stock crashed to $12 a share, but the entire market crashed. And then the stock came way up to over $100 a share. Look at all these buy orders. This bar down here shows you the buy orders or sell orders. When it's a green bar, that means the buy orders are greater than the sell orders and the stock goes up. When it's a red bar, that means the sell orders are greater than the buy orders and the stock goes down. Before 2020, you can see the bars were really low. 
So there was a ton of activity around here. We know why the stock price went up because everything went up after the March crash. But why did it go up so much? It went up like 800%. And also, why did it go down so much? An article mentioned that the company issued $3 billion of stock to take advantage of the high stock price. So when a company issues shares, it dilutes the shareholders. Mathematically, the stock price will come down. Also, the stock price may come down more psychologically because investors are upset they're getting diluted. So they sell more of their shares. But I think the main reason the stock went up so much and down so much was due to Bill Wong's fund. Bill Wong is a shady guy. He got in trouble for insider trading years ago. Then he started a new fund. He bought really aggressively into companies like Viacom, Baidu, Vipshop. And I think Viacom was their biggest investment. In order to leverage himself, he bought into total return swaps. So let me give you an example with Goldman Sachs. He would go to Goldman Sachs and say, I want to buy $100 million of Viacom, so buy it for me. Goldman Sachs says, that's fine. Give us a million dollars for our fee for doing this. So Goldman Sachs goes out into the market and buys $100 million worth of Viacom. They hold it for Bill Wong's fund. Why doesn't Bill Wong just buy $100 million of Viacom and not have to pay Goldman Sachs a million dollar fee. He didn't have that much money. So what he did, he would give Goldman Sachs $20 million in collateral and Goldman would buy $100 million of this stock. If the stock goes up, Bill Wong gets the gain. If the stock goes down, Bill Wong takes the loss. Goldman Sachs doesn't have any risk. The only risk Goldman Sachs has is if the stock price crashes and Bill Wong doesn't have enough money to cover his position. So Goldman buys $100 million of stock and the stock price goes up because investors see Goldman buying all this stock from Viacom. So more people buy Viacom. Bill Wong goes to many other investment banks, Credit Suisse, Numura, does the same thing. 100 million of Viacom, puts up 20 million, and the stock price keeps rising because investors see these big banks buying up all this Viacom. So retail investors like me and you start to buy Viacom as well. And the stock price goes higher and higher and higher. This is all an analogy. I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm just trying to explain how this works. Say the last bank Bill Wong went to was Morgan Stanley. He did the same thing. Buy 100 million of Viacom. I'm going to put up 20 million of collateral. But that was the last bank he went to. By that point, the stock price of Viacom was already $100. The following day, Viacom does a capital raise and the stock price gets pushed down to $70. So Morgan Stanley says, your $100 million of Viacom stock is now worth $70 million. That means you lost $30 million. You only put up 20 million of collateral. So you have to put up another 20 million of collateral. Bill Wong says, I don't have any more money. It's all tied up with the other investment banks. Morgan Stanley says, well, you have to give us 10 million to cover the 10 million you're short so we can sell your position. Bill Wong says, I can't even give you 10 million. Morgan Stanley says, fine, we're gonna sell your entire $70 million of Viacom. We're gonna take your $20 million of collateral. That means we lost $10 million. Since you paid us the $1 million as a fee, we're down $9 million. Don't do business with us ever again. Have a good day. What happens when Morgan Stanley sells the stock? The stock goes down to $50. Bill Wong bought 100 million of stock through Credit Suisse at $80 per share. Credit Suisse says you have to post more collateral. Bill Wong says, I can't do that. I don't have any more money. Credit Suisse takes a loss and sells all of Bill Wong's stock. This happens with every bank Bill Wong bought stock with. It's not just Viacom, it's all the stocks Bill Wong purchased. As these investment banks are selling off all their Viacom stock, retail investors like me and you see this and we sell off our stock. That's why the price of Viacom crashed that day. And that's how Bill Wong lost $20 billion in two days by leveraging himself so much with these swaps. And the kicker is, when someone buys 5% of a company's stock, 
they have to report that with the SEC. So if I bought 5% of a stock, I know I can't afford it, but if I did, I have to relay that information to the SEC. If Berkshire Hathaway buys 5% or more of a stock, they have to let the SEC know. This way, if you're an investor in that company, you'll know the biggest shareholders. But Bill Wong didn't own 5%. Morgan Stanley owned 1%, Credit Suisse owned 1%, Goldman Sachs 1%, and so on. So he circumvented this process, so no one knew he owned all this stock. If Warren Buffett bought 10% of Viacom, you'd be really happy because he's a smart investor and other people will buy it as well. But when a shady investor like Bill Wong buys a big piece of a company, some people would be concerned about this and think he's up to ulterior motives. They pay a 2.6% dividend yield, which is higher than their industry. They were paying an 18 cent dividend in 2019. That's up to 24 cents. To calculate the dividend, you could just take their last dividend payment, multiply it by four, that's 96 cents, and divide by the stock price. That's how you get the dividend yield. And they can easily afford this since that's only 18% of their net income, 24% of their free cash flow. They have a beta of 1.66, so the stock moves a little more than one and a half times the market. It's a bit volatile. It's gone up 24% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 37%. The 52-week low was 29, the high was 102. And the stock is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. And this is a really popular stock. Over 10 million shares are traded each day. 70% are held by institutions, and 7% of the shares are shorted. Their employee count went up with the merger with CBS. They're at 22,000 employees. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd be at $10,000 today. There are no insider buying, but there's a lot of selling. The stock peaked March 21st, 2020, but the stock was trading pretty highly in February. So these people sold at a really good point. This person, Richard Jones, sold 110,000 shares, pretty close to the peak. The biggest shareholder is Vanguard at 10%. Viacom's parent company, National Amusements, also owns 10%, then BlackRock, State Street, and Susquehanna. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have amazing price multiples, a PE of 7.2. A PE below 15 is considered a great value. 7.2 is amazing. They have a really good price to sales of 0.9. It's below one. That means their revenue is higher than their market cap. And they also have a really good price to book of 1.2. But they do have a lot of intangibles on their balance sheet. Their tangible equity is 20 billion. Intangible equity is under 1 billion. A company gets intangible assets on its balance sheet when they acquire or merge with other companies. They have a good return on invested capital. I like to see above 10% since that's the market average. They're at 13%. They can cover their interest payments five times. They have a really high ROE at 17%. They have a good current ratio of 1.8 and a good quick ratio of 1.6. They have 5 billion of cash on their balance sheet, 6.8 billion of receivables, and 1.4 billion of inventory. They seem to be really well funded. They generated 2.6 billion of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months. They have 6.7 billion of working capital, and they only paid out 621 million of dividend payments. So they have 8.7 billion of funding. So they might raise their dividends since they have so much extra cash. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry, I've done videos of nine companies in the same industry as Viacom. And if Viacom has number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So their price multiples are so much better than the average. Their PE is seven, average is 50, because there are a lot of companies in growth mode. When a company has a high PE or price of sales, that indicates high growth in the future. Their price of sales is a lot lower than average, and their price to book is also a lot lower than average. Their current ratio is a little better than average. They have a positive ROE, the average is negative. They're a little lower in debt than the average. They are small in the average company because Netflix and Disney are huge companies that drag up the average. And they're the only company in this industry that pays a dividend because they have consistent cash flows coming in. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 37% discount. And I think this company is even stronger now with the combination of CBS. Plus TV, film, entertainment, that's always gonna be around. Just the way we view it may be different. 
It could be television, computer, on your smartphone. And this is one of the bigger, better ones out there. And these companies always seem to consolidate because in order to scale and become more efficient, it seems like that's the way you have to go. But not all the companies are successful when they consolidate, like AT&T when they bought Time Warner. They ended up losing a lot of money. They should probably just stick with telecommunications and leave the entertainment to companies like this. I ranked their free cash flows 9 out of 10, their revenue 8 out of 10, and their ratios 10 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.